Thank you for coming to Games uh, Inspired by the Arts. Uh, we'll do a quick round of introductions and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the original source of this panel. Um, my name is Daniel Greenberg. I'm an adjunct professor at George Mason University. I work in the computer game design department. My thesis work was on transmediation of games and uh, late era Italian opera, specifically Final Fantasy VI. Um, I now work uh, as an adjunct professor there teaching first and second year students game design. I'm also the founder of Winter Ion Game Studios. Uh, my name is Carl Rauscher. I'm a fiction writer and part-time futurist. I've had a multitude of jobs, uh, everything from retiring from the military to uh, fixing truck scales to my current job, which is currently on furlough and I'm not allowed to talk about it or discuss it. And uh, I recently uh, developed a game supplement uh, for a storytelling game that involved letter writing uh, using historical letters as a reference model to help enlighten people about what life was like at a prior time. Hi, my name is Sean Wyland. I'm a producer at iThrive Games, which is a nonprofit focused on social emotional learning and positive outcomes for teens through games. Uh, I'm currently working on a uh, tabletop RPG engine that uses uh, emotional, social emotional learning skills uh, as your character basis. I have a background in theater, BA in theater, and a master's degree in video game development and production management. And I do a lot of other stuff, but not really related. So I make ukuleles. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, uh, the original name of this, Chris Totten, uh, was a colleague of mine at George Mason. He's now uh, with Kent State University. Uh, this is his panel idea, and a lot of these ideas are stuff that we talked about a couple years ago. Uh, he unfortunately can't make it to the panel. Um, we are doing this in his stead. Uh, Chris studied architecture. Uh, he's got a terrific book on architectural approaches to level design. <laughs> And as someone whose background was outside of video games, but himself did a lot of work in the game sphere, uh, he quickly sort of grew this appreciation and understanding for how do we sort of bridge that gap, right? Where are the common intersections of tools we use, ways we convey information, ways we teach, um, the purpose uh, of the art we're creating, and so forth. So architectural approach to level design. Excellent book. I'm just going to plug that for him right now because he can't be here to plug it himself. But there's sort of this space that exists between how games are made and how art is made. And do those same tools exist? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Um, we'll get a little bit into serious games and sort of why games are developed a certain way that they are. Um, but the real trick is sort of where those intersect, where can we create works of art that are games, or more importantly, games that channel and sort of utilize uh, the tools that fine art has at its disposal. Um, so our topics are essentially uh, selecting works to be the basis of your game. What fine art are you looking to? What are you trying to tackle? What are you trying to share uh, with the world? Um, designing those mechanics based on the work, and this is critical. This is kind of gets to the difference between um, making a game and sort of theming it or skinning it with a fine art concept or actually understanding what it is you're trying to teach and developing that as sort of the, the mechanical core for your game in question. Um, choosing a medium. Uh, there are some subjects that have been conveyed through story, through you know art, sculpture, literature. Um, what subject are you tackling and what makes the most sense because for every one of those styles of art, there's going to be a different tool set at your disposal when you go to convert it to something interactive like games. Um, finally, finding ways to sell or exhibit your art because it's great if you can make it, but it's even better if people can see it. Um, and it has a chance to expand some other minds and change the world even just a little bit. Uh, and then some collaboration opportunities. What spheres exist for you to get that fine art game that you develop out, be it you know museums, academia, commercial entities, um, where the opportunities exist to produce this stuff. Um, before we dig into Clark Ads, uh, any of you guys have a thought on sort of just transmediation or just creating games out of fine art? It's just at a high level. Uh, well, I think first you need to start off with understanding the term art. I mean, for a lot of people, you know, people already take a look at video games and say, isn't that considered a work of art? You know, does it have to be just a game or does it have to be something that can be hung on a wall for people to look at and go, hmm, that's art. And I think for me, 
understanding that art is something that moves you beyond just the medium itself. It's something that either you can be personally feel an involvement with or an attunement to, something you can have an emotional response to. So in which case, if you're, if you're starting off with that process, then what you're gonna build on is gonna build off of that connection point. And I think if you're just looking at something that you don't have that connection to, it's gonna be really hard for you to find that core to turn into in a new medium. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so for me, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't mention what my, my research was on for my master's, but it was about the intersection between video game development and theatrical production practices. And how, for me, theater was, that was my art, and still is. So, so when, you, when you draw on that practice, I found the most direct link was the fact that your players in theater and your players in games are not technically the same. You would think, oh, it's your audience, but it's not. Your players in theater are your actors, and you have to create games. You're going to create games out of theater. You have to think about your actors as your players. Um, and I mean, the most, the easiest direct correlation I think is in Shakespeare, which I love. Anything make games based on Shakespeare um, is that you're going to say we are all players on a stage, and and that is is directly what you're doing when you're when you're trying to create theatrical experiences in the game is you're you're making it for your actors, your players. Yeah, totally. And, and to so, piggyback on that a little bit, yeah. um, this is exactly when we start getting into sort of the difference between different forms, right? In the case of, say, a, you know, television or movie production, one production is baked in. It's been saved, it's, it's there, you run the reel, you see that single instance of it. Mm -hmm. On stage, you see the actors performing multiple instars of this. It may be the same set pieces, it may be the same location, it may be different locations if it's a traveling show. But every time they go out and produce, you know, it might be slightly different. You may have somebody who's an understudy has to come out for one uh, performance. You may have a performer give a particularly good or particularly bad performance on anyone. Right? And then with games, the interactivity comes right from the consumer rather than the, the person inside the art. So there's still a level of instars and instances like is someone playing the game well or are they playing it poorly? If you've been outside and like watched people play Guitar Hero downstairs, depending on who's playing Guitar Hero at the time, you may get a very different experience for the song that is being played. Um, and this is sort of this is where you have to start to understand what form you're going from and what form you're going to, because it's a really big decision point for what sort of game you're going to produce. Um, and this is where we just sort of get into transmediation. Transmediation is just the process of migrating a work from one art form to another. Um, they're fraught with peril, they're tricky, they've been done really, really well, they've been done really, really poorly. I'm dying for someone to really write the book on how to convert uh, games to film because it clearly hasn't been done terribly effectively yet. I liked Hitman. Yeah, I can. <laughs> but, but that's a good, like, any one of those forms to another form is going to be a completely different thing. Um, but when you're developing a fine art game, um, you have to ask yourself, really, what's the purpose of the game? And we can do this for a lot of different motivations. We can be illuminating the previous version of the work. Maybe I'm a huge, huge fan of one particular work of art from a long time ago, like The Count of Monte Cristo. And I want to say, like, this was the original summer blockbuster. People would really appreciate this. I'm going to make, like, a AAA title based entirely, and people are going to play Edmund Dantes, and they're just going to love this, right? And that may be my motivation. It may be to highlight it. There may be someone in my sphere who may have a completely different motivation, like my publisher, who sees this as an opportunity to take an IP and make, you know, 20, 30, 50, 200, 50 million dollars, whatever. They may have their own motivation. And there may be other people entirely whose motivation is entirely entertainment based. They don't really know anything about the Count of Monte Cristo, they just want to be entertained and play this AAA game. But these the points of intersection do exist. Um, and this is where we get to the second one, building interest in the previous art form. This is an opportunity if you are someone who's compelled by theater, compelled by literature, um, to take the opportunity to get people interested in newer forms of art to understand where some of the opportunity for the storytelling comes from. Um, and then, as with most things, this really is a spectrum. This is not a single thing. Very few people have one singular motivation that drives them to the grave. There's usually um, a number of reasons people develop stuff, and games are no exception in this regard. Uh, you may be developing it because it's your passion to produce works in this medium, and you have an interest in this thing, and you have a financial interest because you do have a mortgage payment. Um, there's lots of different reasons people develop. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some examples uh, of games that were produced from fine art. 
Uh, I have two of Chris's games here, Elisitsky's Revenge and La Mancha, uh, as well as Quill, which Carl worked on. Um, but we're going to talk just briefly about these, um, sort of an overview, just so you can see some of the decision points that are made along the way when they're created. Um, I'm going to start with Lizitsky's Revenge. Uh, he had an idea that he wanted to make a game that was based on the themes of an artwork um, and use the same techniques as the artist. So his core idea is he wanted to produce this game for academic purposes. He had the idea that he could take um, an artist's work uh, and produce a game using the same sort of visual guide. Um, he, uh, again, the, uh, he understands the work in question. He's trying to depict a red wedge, which was the Bolshevik Revolution, killing a white circle, which was the Tsar. So it's the beginning of 20th century Russia, right? We have this artist, um, and he's producing this work with a very specific coded theme, and he's going to try to reproduce this theme in game form. Um, so his goal is a simple arcade game, simple art style, very simple verbs. When we say verbs were sort of things like the actions you take in the game, right? Very simple movements, um, 2D, flat, same perspective, same style as the artist. Um, so he tried to pick art and games from familiar references, familiar sources, things that naturally lined up. In his case, uh, he lined it up with, uh, if you're familiar with the screenshot, the Yar's Revenge, right? Old Atari game, um, Howard Scott Warshaw uh, developed. And so he lines up sort of that gameplay style makes sense for him, so he takes the art from Lizitsky and he takes sort of the game structure from Yard's Revenge and he marries these things to make um, Lizitsky's Revenge. Um, his implementation process was real simple. He made a game in Construct 2, handmade the abstract art himself because he had background in traditional drawing. Um, as an architect, he's drawn lines for days. Um, and then just as he expanded the game and more and more levels to his game, he could go deeper and deeper into the artist's catalog. Um, and then sort of just stepping back and looking at the after effect of this, um, having the scope in mind for any project, having the scope in mind is going to make the project easier. Um, still, even then, took him three months, thought it would take a month, he had to cut some stuff out of it. Um, but it was a chance for him to work on an established work of art and try to draw it in. Um, and because it was from a recognizable source and it was an intriguing marriage of things and it was a very accessible game to pick up from a gameplay standpoint, he got some great PR out of this, right? There was some publication of the game being made, he got some reviews online, some YouTubers picked it up and so forth. Um, and this was just an example of sort of an artist, someone who was creative, motivated to take someone or a topic or an art field that interested him and was able to convert that fine art concept into a game and expand it. Um, with that, I'm going to pass this over to Carl to talk a little bit about Quill. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, I not just write uh, stories when I can, but I also like to play games. And one of the things that really has fascinated me is the intersection in uh, what they call story games. Has anybody here heard of Fiasco? We've got one person. Uh, Fiasco. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Fiasco asks you to sit down with a group of friends and basically <laughs> play through a scenario uh, that follows very simple rules uh, where you set up a scene and then the people dictate what happens in the scene and it either is going to turn out well for your character or bad for your character. And it has to do with earning dice and going forth. Uh, the total uh, philosophy of it is based on a Coen Brothers movie. Uh, if anybody's ever seen those like A Simple Plan or Fargo, it really starts off with groups that really have unusual connections to each other, and they have different goals that they're trying to do, and no matter what they do, things seems to go wrong, and it just it starts spiraling worse and worse out of control. This game actually simulated that to a very well degree, but it did it all through storytelling, and coming back from a, a childhood of Dungeons and Dragons, an opportunity to play a game in a medium that didn't involve hacking and slashing, to me was a really exciting idea. So looking to see what other story games are out there, I happened upon Quill. Uh, it was written by, uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name now. Yeah, I don't have the, the original author's name. <laughs> I, was, I was looking it up real quick, and then you turned to me. There is a link at the end of this. I do have a link to Drive Through RPG has Quill and the supplement books available for it as PDF downloads there yep. if you want to dig into it. Uh, but Quill itself, to me, was revolutionary. Number one, it's a solitaire playing game. You do not need to have other people to play it. It's a game about where you write letters. 
And you're thinking, well, how do you turn that into a game? And he did it. Uh, basically, the letters have a very specific structure to them. Uh, you have five paragraphs to accomplish what you're trying to do with it, whether it's to convince a king to let your grandfather go or whether to convince an archbishop to condone your marriage to somebody else, whatever, because it was all set in a medieval type setting. And each of the paragraphs has to contain, has to contain a line that he had from a list of uh, possible lines, either you'd say like horse or white stallion. So you'd have choice of, I had to somehow tie in horse or white stallion in depending on what sort of a dice roll I had. And the whole goal is you're earning points as you're able to use these and build up to. So at the end of your five paragraphs, you've earned so many points for that letter. You compare that to a chart at the end and it tells you how well you did at your letter. If you got a whole lot of points, the king was happy to let your grandfather go. It was obviously a misunderstanding. You sound like a fine, you know, upstart person, and he wants you to come, you know, visit him, and they can talk about future business ventures. If you did a real horrible job of it, not only does he not let your grandfather go, he suspects you as being involved in the plot as well, and he sends his men to throw you in prison as well. Very hilarious to try to see what you can come up with or different outcomes. But I didn't like the medieval setting because we're back to that hack and slash. And although we tried to set it up where you could have different roles in it, whether you're a monk or a scribe or a courtier or that kind of thing, I thought there's so much more we could do with this. And I thought, what if we took something that we already had a good basis of, of when time, when people were writing letters. And I thought, what about the Revolutionary War? They were writing letters all sorts of time back and forth there. As a matter of fact, uh, I was able to find a collection of letters that were written in the Revolutionary War period on a uh, online site called Founders Online, where they took, uh, I want to say, 12,000, 16,000 bits of correspondence from the various founding fathers, transcribed them, annotated them, linked them back and forth so that you can actually follow the correspondence as the letter is received, and then another one was sent out, and you can watch their thread back and forth as the time is progressing. You can see what's happening in period, certain periods of time. You can see who was talking about what. Very, it's, it's a very rabbit hole kind of thing for you to explore, and I highly encourage you to take a look at it if you have the chance. But for me, it was a golden opportunity because I was able to take it and say, how do I turn this interesting ability to write letters from a fictional point of view and give that same sense? And so I started using these historical letters to get a sense of how did people write? What did they write about? What was important in their lives? Not just you know what we thought was important, you know, because we can look back in history and say, oh, you know, the Revolutionary War, you know, it was coming. They should have all known about it. No, they really weren't paying attention at that time. Uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. They didn't even refer to it as the Battle of Bunker Hill, at least not in the correspondence I was able to find. They referred to it as the Siege of Clarkstown. Didn't know that. Uh, also, it was very interesting to see how the letters differed depending on if it was somebody from a high station or a low station. If it was somebody who was more involved in diplomacy or merchants, or were they town leaders, or were they you know, more common folk? Were they from the northern colonies, or were they from the southern colonies? And to see all these different perspectives in that there really helped me flesh out and take what he took to be a simple design and basically a historic and apply it in a whole new way. And I created a supplement called Founding Fathers, of which you can see there. Uh, after I come through an initial draft, I contacted uh, Scott, who's the original author for it. And he was very excited by the idea and said, please run with it. Let me know what you can do with it. So when I finished it, I said, I, uh, here you go. I had to make a couple minor changes to it. And he's like, minor changes? Well, um, how the dice rolls worked. Uh, how the roles were built, uh, what letters you know, could be used for it. Uh, each of the scenarios that he did, you had one major goal that you were doing, I gave him two major goals, so you could select what it was. Uh, every possible outcome had four different possible outcomes, and you had this big chart at the end, you compare back and forth. And he's like, why were all these changes made? I said, well, because I wanted it to be a game that I wanted to play more than once. And this way here, I can play it not only as six different individuals covering seven major periods of history, but each one of those periods of history, I now have two different possible motivations I can do, and I can have four possible outcomes for a total of 64 possible ways that I can make this game happen. 
Plus, I also added elements of if you had a certain outcome that was really favorable, maybe you had a bonus that applied to a future letter. So all of a sudden, I was not writing just random letters. I was actually creating a fictional history for a character that went across the period of time going from the Boston Tea Party to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Sounds really exciting, right? It's a bunch of letter writing, guys. And that's it's actually a tricky thing when you think about it. A lot of times when you're developing serious games, it's tricky to develop games with intrinsic replay value because oftentimes you're developing games to teach something, and if the game is effective and it gets its idea across, then your consumer has, in theory, gotten what they needed from the work and they move on. But you're also supposed to be making something, in theory, that's entertaining or at least engaging. Uh, so finding a way to kind of do both of those things, make it... Uh, provide useful information and make it something that you want to pick up again is usually kind of a tricky uh, thread to, uh, to needle. We, we actually deal with that a lot. And so a lot of my job at iThrive, besides working on this games, I do outreach, outreach with game developers. I, and I go do game jams centered around a social emotional learning theme. And there's like 10 pillars of positive mental health. So the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of uh, kindness and empathy. Uh, we're doing a, a new one for Global Game Jam this year. Uh, and I've done cooperation most recently. Um, and one of the biggest things in teaching those, like you don't want to go make a game about kindness. Uh, it sounds like the worst version of Care Bears <laughs> ever. And I've gone back and watched it and that wasn't as great as I thought it was. Um, but what we have to do and some of the language that we still have to evolve as designers is, is creating experiences where you can play through being empathetic or not empathetic, or kind or not kind, or cooperating or not. Cooperation, we, we've got down a little bit because we have literal co-op games. But teaching developers exactly what cooperation is and how that works on a human and on a mental level has, has been interesting. Once you get those concepts down, you can actually make games that involve it without being preachy or, I know it's not a verb, but teachy about it. Like it's not read a rabbit, it's, you can have Call of Duty, you can have this, but you have to, to thoughtfully and intentionally and appropriately design for those things. Um, and actually, I have a letter writing game for you that came out of one of our game jams that's amazing. Like, it, it, will, it might make you cry, but it's, it's phenomenal. And I, I, I can take it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link. Or I, I'll, I, it's called Sincerely. You can just look up iThrive Games Sincerely. It's, it's really good. And one more example I want to get through here uh, is a game that Chris just recently worked on um, and spearheaded La Mancha. Uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, Don Quixote, um, this is based on his works. Um, however, a 980 page book is a little overscoped for a <laughs> tabletop card game. Um, so he decided to, or excuse me, for video games, he decided to take it out of that realm and try to kind of scope it down to a tabletop card game format. Um, the goal, again, is to fit the narrative of the game, which means as he's developing, he has to think about the mechanics and the rules and the way the game is played, and does that mesh up um, with either the in-book you know in -book story of it or sort of the, the theme around it. Um, and he also wanted to develop it as a bookshelf game. He wanted this to be something that could fit alongside books on a shelf, which even little decisions, right, like the form factor of the box, how big are the pieces, um, what are the pieces that this gets composed with? Is this going to be something that can be married to books on a bookshelf and kind of fit in that same space? Um, and he also wanted this thing to be a social thing, so he needed three to five players, he needed one to two hours, something that was short enough to be consumed by a group of people so that you can make your schedules line up and interact with this thing and enjoy it um, and make it a social game. And then he stopped and looked at the verbs, right? What is it that Don Quixote does? Um, therefore, what are those tools that the book is using? What tools can I line up from the game designer's toolkit to kind of make this work? Um, and the book is about travel, storytelling, quoting, declaring love, fighting, and earning. He sort of takes those big verb themes from Don Quixote, and then that becomes, right, the, the basis for his decks, right? He, this is where he's getting the journey cards, and the chivalry cards, and the treasure cards, is from understanding what the overarching actions inside the narrative are and making sure that the in-game actions kind of uh, are married to that. Um, he has quotes. He goes thoroughly through the game to make sure that there are quotes in the, the subtexts of the boxes um, and that they are um, quotes in response to situations so that players are sort of in the same situation. Um, they're taking actions that are based on chivalric quotes. 
So those different responses um, are the different types of gameplay. And then you just fill out the deck, um, use one card to tell a story, use three cards to compose a poem, use cards plus things that are earned to overcome certain challenges. Sort of take all these different card decks and marry them in a way that they can be used interactively uh, to demonstrate the idea that chivalry as a concept was supposed to be this sort of union of different things, right? Different feats and different renowns and different codes of conduct, and that they kind of came together to form this cohesive philosophy. Um, oh, I didn't realize this was animated. Nice. Um, so, you know, he took this adventure and he added in some things that he thought would make it more intriguing, namely RPG elements, uh, some randomness with dice rolls, um, the fighting cards, the feet cards, sort of the traditional stuff we think of with Don Quixote, like the windmills being the giants and so forth. Um, and that going through the deck is kind of milling through a journey. I know that guy. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Who is that gentleman? That's Jason Weiser. Ah, I'll be. Um, so uh, his postmortem on this was that it had a cross audience appeal. He's been working on it for about two years. Um, not everyone's read the book, uh, as our, I guess we found just a quick survey in here. Um, the early play test included less information on the story prompts, which made it a little more confusing. So once he had a better understanding of like roughly how many people had consumed this work, and if he was trying, one of his motivations was to get it out to people, right? So you have to change the game, which is maybe um, more detailed story prompts, so people understand more context that you're not going in with a certain you know intrinsic extrinsic knowledge assumption uh, for the players who are there. Um, uh, and that it adds to the understanding of classic work, which I think was one of the, the main underlying purposes of the thing in the first place. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, people looking in museums at games and wondering if they were art. But he's got this great um, picture of Proteus, which was shown at Artists Connect at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, we have had uh, numerous opportunities to display work in the way that we display fine arts. We have uh, SAM, which happens over in the Nat um, National Portrait Gallery here in DC. Um, Chris Melzinos, a uh, few years back now, it seems like, did the, uh, the video games uh, exhibit uh, in the Smithsonian. Um, so we are starting to get into locations and spheres where we can start to present this stuff um, as fine art as well, or alongside works in those same um, acts. And when they're functioning, uh, there are organizations that can certainly help with this, the National Endowment for the Humanities, National Endowment for the Arts. Um, there are private institutions as well, um, and grants that are out and available. Sometimes these are groups who are looking for specific work uh, that you might be able to assist as a game developer and help produce for them. Sometimes these are um, grants in search of people with the ideas, in search of particular passions that might line up with their institute's mission um, or the goals of their organization. And there's an opportunity um, as game developers to um, find, find the right language to take the, their fine arts and, and produce them interactively. Um, so before we get into the, the Q&A, and I wanted to leave a, a fair amount of time in this, because uh, there's a number of subjects of kind of a broad overview of, of games as fine art. Um, this is a great opportunity to learn about arts and humanities, right? There's a lot of different medium uh, that we can investigate uh, and find language to use as game developers. But there are also lots of opportunities for game developers to expand the stories they are trying to tell or the worlds they are showing to people. Um, we have told the hero's journey so many times that it's hard to recognize it um, just from the blurriness. Uh, there is an opportunity to tell immeasurable different stories of all different structures and formats. Um, we can go to theater, we can go to literature, we can go to um, works that we're still investigating. Uh, I love the Christos architecture. Architecture itself uh, is this art that has such an interesting story to tell, and it's unique in that in a lot of ways it's been very um, preserved because of its natural like rigidity and structure and importance. Um, and it, it was understood in a way that could be, you know, maintained in certain ways and in a way that other art forms uh, weren't always able to. Um, and it's an, also an opportunity to, as Tim Schafer said, have a rich outer life, right? It's, it's a chance to um, expand not only uh, the things that we try to share with the world, but an opportunity to expand the, what the world is being shared. Um, 
creative individuals have the opportunity just by their nature uh, to produce the things that are out there in the ecosystem of the things that are available. And when you have the opportunity to do something that may serve sort of a greater good or teach an, a useful moral lesson or teach a practical lesson if you want to get into more serious games designs, uh, things involving therapy, things involving um, training. Uh, we have the Virginia Serious Games Institute based out of Mason that's doing stuff for the State Department, doing stuff for um, firefighters, for people that are piloting UAVs, just all these opportunities to develop games uh, with useful, practical, uh, real-world applications. and promoting the arts, educating people on the arts, and sort of bringing uh, the arts and humanities to a larger audience is absolutely um, one of those sort of benevolent activities that comes to mind for me. Um, oh, I read this. Um, just some so Chris's suggestions I'll get through here real quick. Um, he suggests having a rough sketch of your game design beforehand. Uh, think about the size of the game, the complexity of the game. Always consider your audience. Always, always, always consider your audience. Know who you are speaking to with your game. Um, how hard is it to pick up your game and understand what is the age range? What is the demographic? Um, what are their motivations? Are they being compelled to play this thing? Or is this something that they need to voluntarily seek out on their own? There's lots of different variables there. Um, have your design goals inform your choice of work. Um, try to make the, the thing that you are trying to do drive the production of your game. Uh, there's a phrase we've thrown out for years, chocolate covered broccoli. Um, War of 1812 Monopoly will not teach you much about the War of 1812. You may memorize a couple facts and figures, but more than that, it's gonna teach you how to bankrupt your friends because the mechanics of Monopoly are just that. But if you can develop a game whose mechanics and core structure reinforce the lesson that you were trying to teach in the first place or push the thing that you were trying to educate, it's gonna be much more powerful in getting your idea across. Uh, so this is where it comes to analyzing the work, looking for the verbs, deconstruct the thing you are trying to produce interactively, and know what that is when you go forward in your design and planning process for your game. Um, and it may also affect the particular uh, medium that you choose, right? Um, are you making a tabletop game? Are you making an arcade game, a video game, um, so forth? We're not only looking at a wide range of potential source material with all these different media, but we have to think about as game developers, we ourselves have a pretty broad spectrum. Mobile games are very different from tabletop games, are very different from console games, are very different from um, theater games, are very different from uh, sports, are different from gambling. There's so many different um, things at our disposal as designers of games. And it's important to understand that each one's gonna have its own verbs, its own tool set, and sort of be better or worse maybe for your specific application. Um, and seriously, look for opportunities because this is really rewarding work, but it's even more rewarding when people see it. So um, educational games, museums with complementary works, and sources of funding are definitely something you should pursue uh, when the opportunity arises because there are certainly some opportunities out there uh, that may line up with what you want to do, and it may be that what you want to do inspires somebody to, uh, to patronize you, as it would be. Um, I want to leave the remainder of the time we've got for questions and answers. Um, but first things first, uh, Carl, Sean, thank you very much for sitting up here. Um, and thank you all so much for being out here today. really appreciate it. I think we've got like 20 minutes and change. Uh, one thing just to point out there, uh, and it's something that I found it works very, very strongly, when, especially when dealing with art. Remember I said before about finding that emotional core of the reason that you like the art or why it's moving you? Uh, you want your experience, the end result of whoever is playing your game, to share that same feeling. You want them to be able to tell somebody else about, I played this game and it made me feel this way, or it gave me that experience. If you can hold on to that as your core, as you're going through and developing it and use that as your guidepost, it'll give you a better idea of, am I using the right medium for it? And am I choosing the right verbs to do it? I mean, if, if your goal is, you know, you want to have empathy, you want to have, you know, people have a greater appreciation for the environment and, you know, resources and that there, you don't want one of your primary actions that have you have somebody do be to shoot unless you can tie that specifically into how are they supposed to feel as they're destroying something and because that's really what you're talking about when you're doing a shooting game 
you're talking about trying to apply a force across the distance to stop or destroy something. So unless you want that to be part of the feeling that you're trying to get or part of the experience, which it very well could be, then that's something to take into consideration. Uh, has anybody here played a game called Depression Quest? What did you think about it? I mean, but what what was the feeling you got by it? I mean, but, the artwork kind of reflected sort of the state of depression that it is like very dreary and colors were very dark. Yeah. 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 Was your first time any different than the last seven? Um, I don't remember. One of the mechanics that struck with me the most, for those of you who aren't as familiar with it, uh, Depression Quest is an interactive fiction where you're basically you're, you're reading text and then you have a number of choices that you can do. And as you're going through and you're just trying to complete your day, but all of the actions and activities that you're doing are basically depleting the amount of emotional strength and energy you have. So rather than seeing fewer options, you're seeing the same options, but some of them you can't access anymore because you just don't have the strength or the appeal to do that. And as you play through the game further and further, the language reinforces that feeling of hopelessness, the feeling of I just, I can't get out of bed anymore. I can't do that. I'd love to be able to do that. You know, this looks like a really neat option, but I, I just can't access it. And it's that reinforcement over and over again of that feeling that really makes that game stand out and why it was such a powerful moving experience for a lot of people. And again, this is all just a matter of showing you words, offering you choices that you can click on or not click on but still read. Very simple mechanic, very simple operation what you're doing, but like I said, but it's that taking away of the choices that reinforces the emotional feeling for it. So as you're developing your game, think across all the different actions that you're asking somebody to do. And I think that that'll help reinforce it. And again, if you're trying to work off of a core piece of art that you just don't have strong feelings about, it's going to show. I mean, I, I, I'll expand or add, please, a little bit, because, yeah, all, all of that, I think, is completely accurate. But it's uh, any kind of art is, is communication. I am, I am feeling this. This is the thing that I go through. And, and you can and paint, painting is the first thing that I think of, just because you have such a vivid expression of colors and textures. But let's say you're inspired by a painting and you want to make that into a game. Yeah, you have to love that painting and it has to make you feel a certain way. It might not be what everyone else feels. And it might the product might not be an exact expression of that painting, but it's an expression of your feeling and experience, which is the important part that you're drawing from to make it. You have, you have to have that thing you want to say. Oh, like, absolutely. absolutely. And in effect, that's what you're inviting the player to do. Mm -hmm. you're, you're inviting them to create their own interpretation of the art. Right. That's the, there has been another conversation about that, I'm talking about empathy and kindness in games. It's basically you can't, if you want to make a game with feels, you better have people that have feels making the game. Yeah. You can't just be like, wouldn't this be cool? <laughs> no, you gotta, you gotta be living it, feeling it. Offer real intensity there. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? How can you approach um, trying to convey a feeling in a, 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 the majority of people playing the game and connect that to the art? I guess, what's the brainstorming method that you use when you're trying to convey a feeling or when you're trying to inspire an emotion in someone? It, is it completely internal when you're searching for that or is it like a broader like kind of collective, you do like a panel, like how do you convey an emotion? I know when I'm doing it, I try to look towards sources that are not directly in front of me. And usually, the further off I can, the better I am. So if I'm actually looking to create a game that I want somebody to feel that, you know, that charge of, I need to go one more step, one more y'all. I try to think of something that, or an experience that relates to that that is completely different. For example, if I wanted to have somebody do that survival where they've got to keep going, they've got to keep pushing on, they've got to keep pushing on, look to a movie that gave that same feeling to you. Look to a piece of art. Look to a book that you've read. Look to, you know, like I said, it's those other sources 
where you can tap in and say, okay, in this particular scene, man, this, this is, I really got that sense that they had to drive on. And then start deconstructing that. What were the parts of it that really hit home for you? And can you bring some of that back into what you're doing? And because really that's what art is doing. It starts off with a common theme or a role or whatever, but then it's like, what elements do you need to bring into it that reinforce the message you're trying to do? If I was trying to write a short story and I wanted somebody to feel that, you know, that sense of loss, I would start off by thinking about what have I read or what have I experienced that really brought that loss to me? And what can I singularly point to and say, that reminds me of loss? And it, you'd be amazed. It, it's, it's not the most obvious thing. If you were to write down a list of 10 things, chances are you can cross off the first four before you start getting to the ones that are really going to hit home. And then again, uh, just speaking sort of from the mechanical side of things when you're developing the game, um, loss is an example. In order to experience loss, you have to value the thing in question. So is it a limited resource, an unlimited resource, something that you can't get back again? Because without, you know, if you have the ability to restore something, you don't feel the loss. So obviously in that case, it has to be sort of a, a non-renewable resource in the game, um, be it a particular asset you can't get back, or um, RPGs do this all the time. They build up characters that you love, and you get to know them, and then they off them two-thirds of the way through the game to build some sort of emotional connection to push you to go save the planet from being blown up or whatever. It's built up to whatever crescendo, right? <laughs> um, but the idea is the same. If the game produces a non-renewable resource somewhere in its mechanics along the way, and then robs you of it in order to give you that emotional that feeling. Um, and that goes for a lot of different emotions, right? Um, you can experience positive emotions uh, the same way as you can negative ones. It's just a matter of carving your mechanics in such a way uh, to produce that same feeling. Um, for example, giving a player um, some sort of um, ability or some sort of... Companion um, cube. Yeah, something in game um, that allows you to do something you couldn't do before and it, you build an emotional bond to this thing because it affords you an, an expansion of your toolkit. If every game boils down to you carrying a golf club and knowing which one to take out at the right time, the way you build positive emotions is you make people love their golf bag. distinguishes a game is the, me the game mechanics of the interactivity that you have with it. And so you, you take like another piece of art and you figure out mechanics that are inspired from that piece of art. So then how would you go backwards and figure out like, I don't know, maybe something visual that is inspired by a game mechanic? Is that a thing? It, it is. And you're going to love it, Sean. I have an amazing example of this. Um, one of my first panels at MAGFest was Transmediation of Games and Opera, and it was based on a 2013 production of The Magic Flute that was done at the Salzburg Festival um, by a Japanese opera um, director who wanted to make it more video game-like. So he set the stage on this nice isometric perspective. He tilted it up slightly. He had the background doing some parallax scrolling. He had the characters wearing outfits with like bold facets. They looked like Final Fantasy VII characters up there because they were so blocky and their movements just communicated this. But it was a way to sort of bridge the gap. He even modified the plot slightly. He had a bit of a Tron thing going on where the dad, you know, comes home and the grandfather's there with the kids and he falls into the game and they're playing Snake on the TV and it has a little snake going, which sort of, if you know the story of the Magic Flute, it starts sort of in Medi's Rest where the main character's running away from this giant snake. And this gives some context to that, so if people who aren't super familiar with the work, they have something to sort of follow along with and bridge from this sort of an unnatural starting point. But it made sense for what he was doing. And I will tell you, the Salzburg Festival um, is about as harsh or, like, or distinct a critic as you were going to find. Um, the gall it takes for somebody from a foreign country to come in there and modify Mozart's work um, <laughs> in such a, a, a bold way um, but it, it, it got reviews, it did really well. In fact, it did so well that a couple years later, um, the Polish company that they had worked with for the stage and set design and some of the costumes uh, turned around and made an, a mobile game 
based on the opera production that was itself modified by this sort of phantom notion of a video game in the first place. So they produced uh, Magic to the Puzzle Adventure, which was a sliding puzzle game uh, that itself took the same stylized characters and made 3D versions of them, um, took the same rough set designs, um, elaborated on them a little bit, made sort of this three-dimensional sliding um, puzzle adventure, and sort of the reward along the way is you were given um, these short snippet arias and some like little um, objects that were sort of like referential to the opera itself. But yeah, this, this happens both ways for sure. Um, sometimes you will be inspired to take the notions of what games have done and inject them into fine art, and sometimes you will see that fine art offers some things that are really, really useful for you um, from a game perspective. Yeah. And the, the arts are incredibly referential, like at least in theatrical production, in any portion of the theater production, whether it's uh, stage set dressing, costume design, lighting, sound, direction, and acting, whether your first production meeting, everyone pulls together these giant piles of content, whether it's visual or auditory or some, some mix of saying, well, these are my reference points for what I think this play is about. And I, I do the same thing when I work on games. I say, hey, I want everyone, I want you all to have some references. I don't care if it's from other games, other pieces of art, it can be. And I think if you're gonna go, just try to go from games to an artwork, whether it's TV or film or something, sculpture, you should have points of the game that mean something to you. Say, I'm gonna draw from this sound effect and this bit of composition and this scene as you approach a castle, castle at midnight that are, those are your reference points that are meaningful to you that you want to have impact on your piece, whatever it is you're making. And then someone will make a game out of it again, and it'll be really, really... That, that was, that's <laughs> insane, by the way. That, I mean, it's so cool. <laughs> but the fact that it went from one to the other and back... Yeah, it's crazy. Gamify everything. Yeah, nothing is sacred. Yep. Is that the best thing you do with what your students were doing? Like, well, it, it seems like the video games, it's this thin veneer right. of art that goes on top of it. Okay, I code it is um, George DeShiro code. Great, like, would this be, is this really true stuff or bodies that is being presented? Like, it just seems like when Klimt was used in Transistor, mm -hmm. Transistor, no Klimt went with it, it was just a visual right. cue. Like, is that still transmediation as opposed to when you take a book and it goes to the movie and the characters, the themes, the beats are the same? Um, I would argue probably not as much as Chris would have liked, but as much as one month would have afforded him. Um, obviously, the visual structure of his work is there, right? Because he's sourcing it based off of these artworks and he's developing it. Um, having not gotten very far in the game, I can't really speak to whether the level design necessarily communicates the same sort of struggles that we're talking about in that period, or whether um, the artist's particular um, motives and inspirations are really captured by this. It's, I don't think, um, it's necessarily a structural problem. I don't think it's an issue of games being incapable um, or um, even the medium necessarily having deficits uh, when it comes to communicating uh, what fine art can do. Um, I think there's a limitation of scope, a limitation of um, what it is that any individual um, game developer can do at any good point. And one of my favorite sort of um, things I come back to is the best solution for that is almost always to get people who are subject matter experts involved. Um, if you can get someone who really understands um, early 20th century Russian um, art and understands um, sort of that, that world around there, you can produce uh, an even more effective thing um, in question. Uh, now, Chris, obviously, when he developed this, he was doing it Construct 2. There might be some limitations as to what Construct 2 is capable of. I don't know if he's using the full version of the engine um, or the free version, which limits you, if you're familiar with it, to how many um, actual actions that your game can produce, 25 to 50, roughly, whether you add an email address or not, um, how many things you can build or script an engine in-game, um, which is an inherent limiter in his case. but. I'd have to believe that more often than not, this is not an issue of, of games being incapable of reaching the same richness um, as it is perhaps uh, an issue of uh, us failing to meet the same um, sort of threshold or the, the same um, pinnacle that, that some of these previous works did. I mean, they're called fine arts for a reason. It's a very high mountain that we are trying to climb here.
the very new medium. I was going to say, in the case of literature, it's a little bit easier because you got a little more that you can work with. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, if you're trying to deal with a painting, you've got so much by so much space, and you've got to try to read into a lot of what you can of the person's background and try to understand where they were at in their time frame or what little hints you can get by what they title it. When you're talking about a novel, you've got a whole lot more that you can work with. Um, but actually, I find that it's there's a lot more room for interpretation in a novel, only because there's a tremendous amount of shorthand that goes into writing, where they assume you already understand what things are going on and what's about. For example, uh, the, the book Ender's Game. I assume a couple of you have read that one. Uh, we're not going to talk about the movie at all because the movie was horrible. <laughs> but in there, can anybody tell me uh, which character was left-handed? Anybody? It's in the book. Come on. Ender. But you don't notice it. You don't pay attention to it so that when it actually comes across to that particular moment, you're, you're just... You're already visualizing everything that's going on with it. They don't have to tell you what each character looks like if they can just give you a little snippet and it's a shorthand and all of a sudden now you're starting to fill in blanks. When they tell you that you know they go into a kitchen area and it's futuristic because it's on a battle station, they don't have to tell you what everything looks like or what it's made of or what its dimensions are. You're gonna fill in those blanks. And that it's that amount of interpretation of latitude that make it a lot easier to transfer it into something else. Like I said, if I was, if somebody gave me a painting and said, "Here, turn this into a novel," it would be much, much harder. Hmm. Uh, there's actually a group that uh, pairs up artists with writers. Uh, it's called the Spark Project. Uh, they've been doing it. I want to say almost 10 years now. Uh, I got involved with them for a while ago, where they would pair an artist with a writer like me, and give you 10 days to write something or to make something based off of the other person's work. So I would submit one of my short stories to this artist and they would produce a work of art from it. And then they would give me one of their art pieces and I would have to write a short story based on it. It, it is tremendously challenging to write a short story based off of an impressionist painting. Because, I mean, the one that I first had, I actually turned it all for possible ways and orientations, trying to make sense out of what it was I was seeing. And eventually what I did see, I was able to actually come up with a story having to do with uh, Morgana Le Fay back in, uh, on the Oregon Trail, and uh, trying to recreate elements of King Arthur's. It was a really crazy thing. But when I gave that back to the artist, they're like, that isn't even the way the painting was supposed to be held. They're like, you turned it the wrong way, and it was actually supposed to be about this. So coming up with a game, like I said, designed across somebody's painting and art or whatever, I think is really going to be a hard challenge. So if the question is, is that the best we can do? No, I think we can absolutely do better. I'm looking forward to see what right. you can come up with because I really think art is, you've got to bring so much more of it into yourself. And you got to really look for the metaphor and the interpretations. And like, and like I'm not trying to, to bag on the work, but it, it's quite literal which I think was probably where it falls short. It's, it's, it's going directly instead of going for the metaphor. I think you did a good job. I, I th anytime an artist says, oh, you held it the wrong way, you already made it. It's done. Um, it's OK to hold something the wrong way. Like, I was going to say, uh, truth be told, I, I still look at it the way I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it that way. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I make instruments. I made a cello. It's sitting in someone's basement now. Like, I put it in my wine room in my basement. Like, would you ever use it? No. It sits in a basement. That sucks, because I make them all to sound good, but I'm glad you like it. Well, I, I do have to say, for those of you who have ever made games or any other works of art or fiction or anything, the hardest thing in the world is to let it go. Because mm. as soon as you let it go, somebody's going to be like, oh, I didn't like you know, that you had this aspect of your story, because you know, I don't agree with that. That isn't what I meant, but thank you for reading it. Yeah. Or, you know, if I make a game and somebody's like, eh, you know, the, the controls are kind of, you know, it's, it's. But did you like playing it? Did you complete the level? Was it too challenging? The questions we have as designers are so much different than what I have when I'm buying one on Steam myself and I'm going to play it. I think we've got time for one more before we close up. Um,
suggestions for um, helping a game that's based off this topic of the art that's a work of art based on the gun. Right? Um, sort of the uh, reference pool of um, of the to uh, outside the 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 gun to what it uh means. Uh selling something like that. Not just selling it but also finding the best way to do things. People outside the audience might have not seen it. Um, so the question is, how do, how do we get people who aren't already in the sphere of the subject matter we're trying to tackle interested um, in the work in question? And, and in this sense, video games have an almost unfair leg up on a lot of other forms already. Video games are really entertaining. Video games are very compelling. Video games have stormed their way to being the most profitable entertainment medium here and abroad for a reason. They are extremely effective at getting attention. Um, what you do with that intent, yeah, attention and sort of how you go from there is the next big question. Um, obviously, the denser the work, the more complex the subject matter, um, the more archaic the writing, or um, in the case of uh, certain um, art forms that are more or less subject to interpretation, how to carve through that and really distill it into a way that we can communicate through game mechanics. Um, those are harder questions, and they're going to vary from, from work to work, obviously. Um, but I think the thing I want to mention just off the bat is we've got the first part of that pretty much down pat. Uh, at this point, there's not a whole lot that we're still looking for in terms of how do we make these things interesting to people. Um, the question now becomes, uh, for works of fine art, um, how do we do that work of fine art justice? How do we communicate its message? How do we make it interesting? Um, to them without essentially um, going back to sort of the chocolate covered broccoli thing. Um, we're not making, you know, Call of Duty and Prejudice, right? Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, there are ways to do it, um, but actually, that one, was, was that really still Pride, Prejudice, and Prejudice? That's a little... Well, that, that's yeah. a really good one. It's still the only way I was able to read. Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, maybe, maybe I rescind my previous point. Well, I think the, the right way, if you're, if you're just trying to pitch it to someone, is, is to use modern metaphors that make sense to them. So if you're trying to make a game based on Picasso, uh, all right, so this is whatever you want to call it. It's like asteroids mixed with uh, 2D modernist art and a dash of, I don't know, Sonic like the Hedgehog. Something that, that's, going to be, that's going to make sense, even though that sounds like a really weird mashup. If, if you can peg other touchstones to relate that message to, to, to the audience that you do want that's not familiar with that sphere of work, that's, that's kind of how I would start pit, try to pitching it to other people. Uh, you also might want to consider uh, the gameplay itself and the interesting hook of their part of the mechanics mm -hmm. may not be the fact that you based it off of a major piece of art. Let that be something that develops afterwards. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example in a game I can't. However, in a movie I can. Have you ever heard of a movie called The 13th Warrior? Yeah. With Antonio Banderas? Pretty awesome, right? Vikings, monsters running around, chopping stuff up. Who can, who can miss on a movie like that, right? Uh, that was based off of Beowulf. And they didn't even try to hide it very well. But they knew they couldn't sell it by saying, hey, we made a modern version of Beowulf. Otherwise, they would have called it that, and it would have flopped like all the other ones that they called Beowulf. Instead, they took the convention of Beowulf, and they told it from the viewpoint of a Middle Eastern contemporary. And then they sold it as, here's an amazing adventure that talks about this particular time. And they emphasized the part about the sword play and the part about the fighting and let you learn as you go that this is actually based off of an extremely old work of literature. So, so with, your, with your game, you said, you've got the game, you've put in the passion, the part that you love most about the artwork, lead with that first. 
lead with the passion, lead with that experience you're going to give them, and then say, and it's based on. Yeah. Um, or inspired by. Yeah. Sort of just so I, I think what we're getting to here is really relatability, right? In both cases, can your audience, and again, understand your audience, can they process the ideas you are trying to get across? Those ideas will eventually lead them to whatever result you're getting, whether it's a late reveal or whether um, it's a slow roll where things go from sort of um, they're in and they're hooked and they're interested and they're listening and they're building it and then they're starting to pick up some of the lessons along the way. There have been a lot of games that have used this sort of um, reveal over time effect um, in a way that they ensure they have audience attention, audience participation, then they understand that there's sort of that educational component that goes into it. Um, running up to somebody and telling them I have a really exciting lecture for you um, may work okay here in mages, doesn't work super okay uh, out on the streets. Um, but if you tell them you've got a super interesting, exciting action game for them, and after 20 hours of playing it, they've come away understanding a lot of the same concepts and having some you know, feelings about things um, that are tangential, if not overlapping uh, with the work you're trying to communicate to them, uh, that's going to go a long way. And with that, we have hit our time wall. So again, thank you all so much for coming out here um, and have a wonderful rest of your MAGFest. Thank you.